deadly winter storm on the move, dumping a dangerous mix of snow and ice from the Great Lakes through the Northeast. That trooper dash cam take a close look, capturing the close call when a pickup truck lost control on a slick Iowa highway and whiteouts in a number of states, making for treacherous driving like here on North Jersey's I-80. Blizzard conditions hammering parts of the high plains and upper Midwest. 70 million Americans facing winter weather alerts, hundreds of flights canceled, and stretches of interstate shut down. ABC's Kaylee Hartun experiencing that fast-moving system firsthand in Detroit tonight and starting us off. Oh! Tonight, a deadly winter storm, barreling across the country from the Midwest to the Northeast, bringing heavy snow and treacherous travel conditions. 70 million people under winter weather alerts. In Iowa, this heart-stopping moment caught on camera. A pickup truck sliding off the road, nearly slamming into officers, responding to another incident. Watch again as the truck plows towards them, nearly crushing this person who barely had time to react. In Nebraska, one person killed in a crash. Authorities responding to 200 weather-related incidents since Friday. No travel advisories issued in parts of Minnesota and the Dakotas. Blizzard conditions forcing officials to shut down hundreds of miles of interstates. Roads littered with jackknife trucks. Freezing rain and ice wreaking havoc in Pennsylvania. Motorists abandoning cars on the side of the road. New Jersey roads not much better. Heavy snow creating nasty conditions. Alpine Meadows, avalanche. Out west, a deadly avalanche at a ski resort near Lake Tahoe. Looked over to our right and saw the slide start to go. Um, we yelled. 34-year-old Cole Comstock was killed and another man seriously injured. All right, Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Detroit. And Kaylee, we're just learning about a plane skidding off an icy taxiway in Illinois. That's right, Tom. A Delta flight headed for Detroit slid as it was taxiing at Quad City International Airport in Illinois. Officials report icy conditions there. No one was injured. Across the country, nearly 700 flights have been canceled and more than 2,700 have been delayed. Tom. Koalas rescued from fire, now carried from floods. Last week, bushfires came within 10 kilometers of the Australian reptile park. Have a go at it. Look at what's coming in the park, a wall of water. Since Thursday, heavy rain has lashed parts of Australia's east coast. For Queensland and New South Wales, plagued by record-breaking bushfires, this was welcome relief. Hello, mate. What are you doing? He's just drinking water. In New South Wales, a wounded koala licked water off the road. The Rural Fire Service here said rain fell across most of its fires, although dozens still burn. It's just beautiful listening to it though, listening to it on the roof. It's a long time since we've had it. Yeah, so we're enjoying it. Up to 300 millimetres of rain fell in southern Queensland, forcing commuters to get creative. 70% of Queensland is affected by drought. Oh my goodness! This was the first time 14-month-old Lacey Sewell had ever seen rain. You're right. Much of Australia's been in drought for a good two, three years, but certainly across that area where the fires have been at their worst, you're, you're looking at really heavy rainfall coming in on parched ground. The trees have obviously been damaged, if not destroyed, so they're not able to soak up the water. The ground's rock hard, it will tend to just wash off, so that's why you do essentially get the, the, the flooding. For many Australians, flooding is a small price to pay. Bryce Chapman's farm is in the grips of drought. He's been hand feeding his cattle to keep them alive. Oh, I love it. I don't care how wet it is. It can rain all, all the week as far as I'm concerned. We've never had so much rain in so many years. Well, since I've been here 17 years. The rain is expected to move south over the next few days and bring relief to the state of Victoria, where firefighters continue to be dwarfed by flames and they could use more help from above. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera. And now to other news. New arrests investigators say are tied to what authorities describe as a neo-Nazi group. The arrest announced just before the Virginia Supreme Court upheld a gun ban ahead of a Monday rally where the FBI says several alleged members of the white supremacist group were planning to attend. ABC's Kira Phillips is in Washington with this story. Good morning to you, Kira. 
Good morning, Eva. Well, as of this morning, law enforcement around the country have been put on alert by the FBI, Homeland Security, and the National Counterterrorism Center warning about possible violence at this upcoming gun rally on Monday in Virginia. This warning comes after seven suspected members of the neo-Nazi group The Base were arrested this week. Court documents describing them as a racially motivated violent extremist organization. We're seeing threats of violence. We're seeing threats of armed confrontation and assault on our capital. In Georgia, the FBI says these three men allegedly had plans to overthrow the government while planning an attack on members of the left-wing group Antifa. That same day in Wisconsin, federal charges were brought against this man for his alleged role in vandalizing a synagogue. And just two days ago, three other men alleged to be base members were arrested. Investigators believe they were plotting to attend the Virginia rally with hopes of starting a racial war. They're not coming to peacefully protest. They're coming to intimidate and to cause harm. Virginia's governor now declaring a state of emergency, imposing a weapons ban. President Trump calling out Northam, saying the Second Amendment is under very serious attack in the great commonwealth of Virginia. No one wants another incident like the one we saw in Charlottesville in 2017. It was Charlottesville just two years ago when a neo-Nazi plowed his car into a crowd of protesters, killing 32-year-old Heather Heyer and injuring dozens of others. And now authorities believe that this man, Patrick Matthews, a Canadian Army reservist trained in explosives and arrested this week in Delaware, trained with the three men that are now under arrest in Georgia. And I can tell you, law enforcement sources are telling me this morning there's a much heavier presence of both local and state police. They do not want to see another Charlottesville in the area. I'm also told that some counter protesters are pulling out of the rally as well, citing safety concerns now. We'll be following it. Certainly nobody wants to see any violence, that's for sure. Kira Phillips for us in Washington, thank you. Highway shooter arrested in North Carolina tonight, accused of shooting at least 20 cars over two days. Tonight here, the images of shattered windows, and authorities now say the shooter is just 14. Here's Victor Akendo. This car window shattered by a suspected highway sniper. It was still just mind-blowing and still you know, it's still shocking to say something like that. It all happened along US 264 in North Carolina this week. Authorities say at least 20 passing cars were shot at and damaged with a high-powered pellet rifle. The Wilson County Sheriff says they started receiving calls yesterday morning, drivers reporting bullets blasting through their windows. Others saying the sides of their cars had been damaged. Hugh Scott is a principal at a local school. He was on his way to a school sporting event when his car got hit. I thought this was an isolated incident. At the time, finding out that more vehicles had been shot, I, I felt that I needed to, you know, just make people aware that this isn't a hoax. Tonight, deputies arresting a 14-year-old boy, releasing these images of a nest made out of tree branches. That's where officials believe the teen hid and fired shots at passing cars. I am truly blessed, um, and I'm very grateful that um, that this wasn't a greater or, or more serious incident. Deputies set up patrols and undercover surveillance. They found ammunition near that apparent nest, and that's what led them to their 14-year-old suspect who lives in that area. Tonight, he is being charged as a juvenile, but thankfully, David, no one was hurt. Victor, thank you. Now, violence has once again broken out in Hong Kong after pro-democracy demonstrators attempted to march through the city in defiance of a police ban. Riot police have fired tear gas at protesters and arrested several people. Earlier, thousands had gathered in the center of the city for the latest anti-government demonstration. Now, authorities had approved that rally as long as participants stayed in one location, but police did warn that they would stop anyone attempting to march. Well, our correspondent Sarah Clark is joining me now live from Hong Kong. Sarah, we've been seeing these pictures of what looks like quite a bloody crackdown on today's rally. What's been happening there? 
Well, it started as a peaceful gathering. Thousands uh, were assembled in a central, in part of central Chater Garden. Now, the organisers of this particular march had requested uh, to march, to actually leave that particular location and go towards Causeway Bay, but the police denied uh, that request. And as a result, they've gone ahead with the march, or the, the rally, I should say, but they started to march. And this is where the police said they will move in and try and disperse the crowds if they start to block roads. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, parts of central, very busy thoroughfares, uh, two or three lanes started to be blocked. Uh, you might be able to see behind me now the people have got about 500 metres down the road uh, and they've been met with a police line. Uh, we've got hundreds of riot police have been deployed today to try and disperse these crowds to stop this march going ahead. Uh, we've only heard behind me, we've got some rowdy kind of chanting and yelling at the police at the moment, but we've had a few rounds of tear gas fired uh, in uh, central at Chater Garden. We've also had some sponge grenades uh, being uh, fired as well. Uh, and as you mentioned, there have been a number of arrests. But the police have said uh, all week that if this march does go ahead, uh, they will move in and they have. Sarah, we're seeing this increasing crackdown and it's now been nearly eight months of unrest. There seems to be no end to this impasse. So where to from here? Well, certainly we're seeing a, a bigger crackdown by the police on these rallies, on these gatherings and the protests. A number of have been denied uh, in recent months. Uh, we've also got the very busy Chinese New Year Festival, which begins this week. This is a, an annual festival. It's a big celebration in Hong Kong. We've got traditional fairs uh, and events uh, over about two weeks, but a number of those fairs have been banned. There's extra security at those festival locations uh, that are going ahead. Uh, but the police, as I mentioned, uh, they're starting to crack down on these protests. And I've, we've seen increasing uh, amounts of violence or certainly clashes uh, between some of the hardcore protesters uh, and the police uh, over recent months. We had a big rally uh, on New Year's Day here in Hong Kong uh, and today is, or well, Sunday is the first time we've seen tear gas fired uh, since that New Year's Day rally. But certainly uh, we're seeing an increasing clamp down uh, from the police on the go-ahead of these protests and also the number of arrests. Sarah Clark there, live for us in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Sarah. Do stay safe. If you know anything about me, then you know I'm obsessed with the whole gender thing going on right now. In fact, it plays a huge part in my new book coming out later this year, which you can get news about by following me on Twitter at The Resident. So anyway, anytime there's news about gender stuff, I am all over it, like this. The state of Michigan is now considering adding a third gender option for residents applying for driver's licenses. They want to add a non-binary designation, although they aren't sure what that should be called yet. That's one of my favorite parts of the non-binary thing. No one knows what the hell to call this new genderless gender that seems to want to emerge in our species. They keep trying with the they and the them thing, they and them, but that's not working. We all know that. It's too confusing and it's just not catching on. But anyway, if Michigan goes through with it, it'll be the 14th state to add a third non-binary gender option. Yeah, that's right. 13 states have already done it. So have Washington, D.C. and New York City, of course. Most of those who've done it are adding a third option as just X. So instead of checking off M for male or F for female, people can choose X as their gender instead. Again, Mich Michigan isn't sure how they'll designate it, but so far the X has been a popular choice, which to me is much cooler and less confusing than they. Now, I'm not saying this is right or wrong to do. I'm just saying we're doing it and I love watching it happen because I am a true progressive. Not like the people who call themselves progressives, but just lean very politically left, no. To me, real progressives should have no political inclinations whatsoever because progress doesn't care about your health care plan or who you marry, no. Progress doesn't care about anything, it just happens. And it's happening now, faster than ever, thanks to technology if you ask me. And it's making our species want to evolve faster too, as we have been evolving for millions and millions of years. And that's why I'm so interested in the new gender, because to me, clearly, it's just another step in our obvious evolution, our progression, if you will, into our ultimate end form, which is, of course, aliens. So yeah, I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care how you feel about yourself and your gender. I care about our evolving into aliens which is why I'm fascinated with all these states adding third genders. Again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying clearly, it's what we're doing. And like I always say, like it or not, you just can't stop progress. So you might as well enjoy watching it happen.
for the first time in a long time, Iran's supreme leader is speaking out, lashing out at the United States. As he delivered his first Friday sermon in Tehran in some eight years, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said President Trump is, quote, a clown who only pretends to support the Iranian people while actually stabbing them in the back. Khamenei also said the cowardly killing of Qasem Soleimani had taken out the most effective commander in the battle against ISIS. Meantime, CENTCOM has corrected the claim that there were no U.S. casualties following the strikes from Iran. RT's Rachel Blevins is following the story. She's been uh, following the story and joining us from the newsroom with the latest developments on this. Uh, so, Rachel, what more can you tell us? Well, Manila, we just heard from the U.S. Special Representative for Iran, and he said the latest round of sanctions target another one of the country's top generals over the claim that he ordered the killing of more than 100 protesters. Brian Hook also confirmed that the U.S. has no plans to pull back on sanctions anytime soon. Iran said that this concludes the retaliation uh, for Qasem Soleimani. They appear to be standing down for now, uh, but we have the combination of uh, maximum economic pressure and restoring deterrence by the credible threat of military force if attacked is going to do more to advance peace and stability in the region than a policy of accommodation with the regime. Now, these comments follow a fiery address from Iran's supreme leader in which he criticized the United States for publicly claiming to support the Iranian people while stabbing them in the back by implementing heavy sanctions that hit the civilians the hardest. Spokesman for the wicked government of America keeps saying that we are standing with the Iranian people. You are lying. If you do stand with the Iranian people, it is because you want to stick your poison dagger into the chest of the Iranian nation. During his first Friday sermon in nearly eight years, Iran's leader condemned what he called the cowardly killing of General Soleimani, and he argued that the U.S. had actually harmed itself by taking out the most effective commander in the fight against ISIS. He also questioned why, after ordering the assassination of Soleimani, the Trump administration paraded the Iranians who celebrated it, but failed to acknowledge the millions who took to the streets to show their support for the general and to mourn his death. Now, Manila, the U.S. has spent months months increasing sanctions on Iran after pulling out of the JCPOA, but Tehran is still claiming it will not back down even if the increased pressure continues from the West. So now, Rachel, what is the latest from the U.S. on those retaliatory strikes from Iran? Well, the Pentagon initially claimed there were no casualties when Iran responded to the killing of Soleimani with a barrage of airstrikes last week. However, officials from U.S. Central Command are now saying that the ballistic missiles targeting the Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq left at least 11 U.S. troops injured. In a statement, a spokesman said, quote, while no U.S. service members were killed, several were treated for concussion symptoms from the blast and are still being assessed. Now, while President Trump initially downplayed the airstrikes launched by Iran because they did not appear to harm any U.S. soldiers. It remains to be seen if his administration will respond to the latest news by looking to escalate the current military tensions even further. Reporting in the newsroom, Rachel Blevins, RT. Overseas for the first time in years, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini led Friday's prayers in Tehran. It's a sign of how much pressure the regime is feeling. Now with crippling sanctions and Iranians protesting in the streets, some people wonder if this could be the moment the Iranian regime will fall. Here's one perspective from Reza Pahlavi, the son of the former Shah of Iran, who spoke this week at Washington's Hudson Institute. I think people smell the opportunity for the first time in 40 years this time. Very different than 2009, even very different from 1997. The people have had it. Today's generation of young Iranians cannot take it anymore. They want to have an opportunity for a better future. They want to be on the path of modernity and freedom. The only thing that stands between them and the free world is this regime. Our Chris Mitchell joins us from Jerusalem with more. Chris, is Reza Pahlavi one alternative to the Iranian regime? Yeah, Mark, he is one alternative. He's not the only alternative, though. He is an alternative that many people in Washington would be looking for. He's the son of the Shah of Iran that was disposed 40 years ago. But there are many opposition groups uh, representing many of the ethnic groups uh, all, all over Iran. 
Uh, you know, we're talking about possible regime change. There's two big questions to remember, Mark. What is going to happen to the security apparatus? These are some of the bejis. You see these security officials out on the street uh, beating people and shooting protesters. You know, the hope is that they could turn away from the regime and turn with the people. In fact, you see uh, confrontations of the people telling the bejis, come with us go against the regime. We'll see if that happens. And then uh, maybe this is too far in advance, but if the regime did fall, what kind of transition would it be? Would it be a violent one? Could it be a peaceful one? Uh, we'll see. But right now, as uh, Reza Bavlavi said, uh, you know, this could be the time after 40 years of the Islamic regime. Chris, could this be a time for President Trump's tear down the wall moment? And explain what is meant by tear down this wall. Yeah, some people may not remember, but in 1987, Ronald Reagan had a speech at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. He called on uh, then uh, Soviet leader Mikhail uh, Gorbachev, tear down this wall, tear down the Berlin Wall that had been up there for years. Some people are looking at President Trump's tweets to the Iranian regime as an incremental way of saying sort of tear down this wall and have the regime fall. But right now, the official U.S. policy is not to have regime change. We'll see if that happens and we'll see if there's any connection between many of these opposition groups and the U.S. administration. How important is prayer during this time for Iran? Mark, it's vital and it's pivotal, really. Uh, there's one example I can cite, Dick Eastman, he's the head of Christ for the Nations. Back in 1987, he felt the Lord told him to go to the Berlin Wall and put his hands on it and say five words, in Jesus' name, come down. Now, there were many other people praying inside the, the Soviet Union and around the world, but prayer is pivotal back there in the Soviet Union days and today now in the Islamic Republic. Amen. Well, what do you have coming up on this week's Jerusalem Dateline? Well, we have a round table with uh, our colleagues, uh, George Thomas and Gary Lane, talking about Iran. They have bring years of experience reporting on Iran. We have Magdala, which is a story about the first century synagogue discovered up in the Galilee, and Passages, which is a story about Christian students coming to Israel for the very first time, uh, and really having a life-changing experience. That's just some of what we have on today's Jerusalem Dateline. All right, thank you, Chris. Appreciate your time, sir. In an exclusive interview with Al Jazeera, the spokesperson for Iraq's Hezbollah brigades has confirmed a meeting in Iran of all the major Shia armed groups in the region. It was held in the city of Qom, and he said they chalked out the future course of action against, quote, U.S. aggression. Let's uh, find out what more he had to say from Osama bin Javed, joining us from Baghdad. Osama. But in, in this exclusive interview, the spokesman uh, Mohammed Mohi of Kataib Hezbollah or Hezbollah Brigades Group is uh, opening up for the first time in front of the media after the attacks which took place uh, on the border between Iraq and Syria and then the attack on the U.S. Embassy and the ensuing targeting of uh, the commander of uh, the Popular Mobilization Forces, uh, Abdul Mehdi al Mohandis and Qasim Soleimani, as well as the attacks that followed that uh, by Iran. Uh, in a wide-ranging interview, he did tell us uh, about this important meeting which took place in the city of Qom between what he called forces which are aligned to uh, the resistance in Iraq and forces which are the Shia militia fighters, not just in Iraq but across the region. He said they answered the call of Muqtada Sadr and they all sat down. And you will see that as a result of a uh, one of the outcomes of this meeting is going to be protests which are going to happen in Baghdad in a few days uh, where Muqtada al Sadr is called for a million man march. About the future course of action against US forces, he said uh, the uh, Kataib Hezbollah, Hezbollah Brigades group has the capability of striking the U.S. forces whenever and uh, however it wants, but it is going to follow the Iraqi government's decision to make sure that they expel U.S. and foreign troops out of Iraq. He refused to confirm that it was them who were behind the Kirkuk attack, which uh, resulted in an attack on them on the Iraq-Syria border. Uh, but he did say they have the capabilities, including drone capabilities. And I asked them whether it was they were chosen by Qasim Soleimani uh, to carry out these attacks inside Iraq. 
Not only Qat Taib Hezbollah in Iraq will face the U.S. troops, and not only Qat Taib has the ability for confrontation, but the whole Iraqi people will face down these troops. It is true that Qat Taib has high capabilities and high training due to its history in fight against the U.S. occupation. It's also due to accumulated knowledge in fighting ISIL after 2014. Maybe Qat Taib was the best and only force to deal with different kinds of weapons, especially those modern weapons, and dealing with U.S. weapons. This may have made Qat Taib a target, but we say that we are ready and prepared to fight against anything Iraq faces. It will not be alone in the confrontation. The whole Iraqi people and the resistance groups, all of them will be confronting the U.S. troops. And this is a group which has been designated a terrorist organization by the United States. I asked them whether they're in hiding after these threats and they said they are operating out in the open. Uh, he met us in the middle of the street. He said they are here. They are here to stay. And on another note about the protesters who've been asking for an end to the influence of Iran and the United States, he said that the, uh, he and the Qatayb Hezbollah group is against the presence of any foreign forces, whether those are American troops or Iranian troops. All right, Osama, thank you for bringing that for us from Baghdad. So, me and a group of students from my school wanted to pray for our former classmate's brother who had got hurt in an accident. After the prayer, our principal told us, don't do that again. So the next day, parents had called and complained. He told us that we could pray, but he said we had to hide in the gym or behind a curtain or somewhere away from everyone else. And I know that if this can happen in a small town in Texas, it can happen anywhere across America. And that's not right. No one should feel ashamed of their faith, especially in a school or anywhere. Well, and, so, and what, what, so what ultimately happened? How was that resolved? Um, so we got with First Liberty. They've been amazing. They supported us the whole way and they sent the school a letter and the school complied with the letter and changed it. Yeah. And now you're able to do that? We are. I'm Marilyn Rames. I'm the founder and president of Teachers Who Pray and um, I founded Teachers Who Pray because I, as a teacher, believe in the, the beauty of every child and the um, unlimited potential that resides within. However, the students that I was getting weren't set up for success because they were so significantly behind grade level. Um, and I taught in Chicago Public Schools for 14 years and during that time we were losing students every year to gun violence. At one year it was like 30, 32 students getting killed and I was overwhelmed with the, the the heaviness of the work. So I thought about quitting and I, d I decided not to. I was going to fight and I was going to pray and uplift my spirit so that I can do the job that I knew God had called me to do. So I began praying with other teachers in the building who were like-minded and we um, really supported each other, built community, built more hope, built more joy in the work despite it being so difficult. And um, we grew, like right now there's over 150 chapters of Teachers Who Pray because teachers need that, that spiritual support and guidance. And today I believe it's super important because there is a, a myth out there that what Teachers Who Pray does and other um, organizations do for teachers, spiritual wealth is not legal and it absolutely is. And I'm here to tell teachers that we need to pray if you're of faith. We need to pray. We need to bu buckle up and just do what we have to do for our kids because they need us and they're depending on us. And if we're not strong, we can't make them strong. So that's why I'm here. It all started when I walked in the classroom. I was, it was Ash Wednesday and I had my ashes on my forehead. And the, all the kids in the classroom was like, is that dirt on your forehead? Because they don't know because I'm Catholic and they're all Mormon. So because I was like, there, I, there was like, I was like the only Catholic in that school, so. Then the teacher came up and like, it's unacceptable, wipe it off. And I told her four times and she didn't listen and she made me wipe it off in front of all the kids. Wow. That's my story, so 
Thank you, Mr. Well, it's not going to be happening anymore, okay? Thank you, Mr. All right. My name is Chase Windebank. Uh, I started a small group of students praying in high school during a free period. And by my senior year, it had grown to a community of 90 students, and it was so encouraging. But, but later in the senior year, the administration wound up banning us from praying during school hours, not even during lunch. And so I remember thinking I didn't want to file a lawsuit at all, but after many meetings unsuccessful with the administration, I wound up realizing it was the only way to secure future students' rights to pray. And so thank you, sir, that now I get to have the opportunity to tell students to live out their faith in big and small right. ways right. in the future. And you guys are making sure that the founding fathers are um, living on in our nation. So thank you, sir, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I pray five times a day, and I had to pray at lunch. And I would bring the hijab to cover my hair, and kids would make fun of me, harass me, and attack me. And I would tell the principal, and the principal actually blamed everything on me at the end. Me and my mom complained so many times, and I didn't have a good education at the end. So, yeah, everything was blamed on me. But we're going to take care of it, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. In my middle school, I was the only Jewish person. And I was very open with my religion. I would announce when I had Shabbat plans, which is a day of prayer and rest. And when we started our Holocaust unit, it ended with everybody being nice to me because I spoke out about it. And I wanted to inform people and I wanted to help people learn. And the students started to write swastikas on my belongings, on my arms. Um, I was pushed and shoved in the hallway. They even went so far as to take my face and put it on Anthony's body. And it was sent around to three different schools. And I was terrified to say I was Jewish. And that should never be in anyone's mind. Anyone in school should be able to say, I am whatever religion I am. I practice this and I believe this. And it's been three or four years since middle school. I'm a junior in high school and I've continuously fought for anyone to have the right to exercise their constitutional rights in school. Mr. President, uh, Coach yes, Kennedy, yes. Uh, we Coach. talked a few times. Uh, I coached up over in Bremerton High School right. in Bremerton, Washington, and I was fired for praying after football games. Right. And it's just so nice to have First Liberty um, representing me and having a president that has the guts to stand up for us. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Coach. You rock. Good coach, too. <laughs> I started a prayer altar at my school, and it helped a lot of kids who had many different prayer requests just to let them know that someone was there for them and cared for them. And Americans United for Separation of Church and State sent a letter to our Board of Education that the prayer altars needed to be taken down. And whenever my teacher told me my school was notified that I had to take my prayer locker down, I was heartbroken because I had like 10 prayer requests a day and that was, I just feel like it really helped move in our community. That's about, about yes, I have, I've got lots to tell you. Go on, just give us... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? Yes, I mean, I that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me and he loves you too and he loves you too. He loves these people in here and he loves everybody in the world. You All you've got to do is repent of your sins and you will be, get, be forgiven. And do you think you can win Spotty? Do you want to win Spotty? John 3.16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and shall not perish. Okay, Tyson. Uh, any final any final message to those people who who have criticized you in recent there's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people to all sorts of yes, people yes, yes. just give us just give us your take on it do you stand by your comment believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved okay Tyson the only way is through Jesus into heaven that's all i can say the a to z the alpha the omega Tyson. jesus is the way the key and the only way into heaven Okay, so thank Peace you out. so much. Thanks for stopping. Thank you.